On March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared that the COVID-19 outbreak was so bad that it had become a global pandemic, which meant this new highly infectious disease had spread virtually everywhere on the planet. And so around the time this global pandemic announcement was made, governments around the world began instructing their citizens to stay home and avoid all physical contact with other people outside of the people that you lived with. The idea being these quarantine measures would help stop the spread of the virus. Initially, world leaders and citizens believed these quarantine measures would have a dramatic impact and it would stop the spread and before long, COVID would be under control and life would just kind of magically go back to normal. But unfortunately, that is not what happened. By June, so three months into the global pandemic, positive COVID cases were only going up, not down. And so it was around that point in June that people all over the world were starting to come to terms terms with the reality that COVID was not this simple problem with a simple solution. It was a complex health issue that likely was going to be around for a long time, which also meant these strict quarantine measures also would likely be around for some time. Now, the efficacy of these quarantine measures were quickly called into question, and it was all over the news and politicians. All they wanted to talk about was, do these measures work? Is it having an effect on the spread of the virus? But for everyday people, the real concern was not politics. It was practicality. How do you live a full and happy life in quarantine? In June of that year, 54-year-old Sandra Hughes was pondering that question. To that point, her life had really not gone the way she had planned it. She had been married, twice actually, but both relationships had ended in divorce, and she had never had children. She lived in beautiful Maui, Hawaii, but she hadn't really lived there long enough to consider it her home, and prior to that, for the bulk of her adult life, she'd kind of lived this nomad lifestyle, bouncing around all over the country, and so really she had never developed a home of sorts. She was an accountant by trade, but in college, she had studied not just accounting, but also wilderness survival, which she happened to be incredible at and was very passionate about. Growing up, she had always been a big outdoor enthusiast, and so she had always thought one day she would become a park ranger, and so that's why she was studying wilderness survival in college. But as these things go, after she graduated college, she did not become a park ranger. She became an accountant. And now, 30 years later, here she was. However, in June of that year, with COVID quarantine restrictions putting her and everyone else's life basically on pause, Sandra suddenly saw an opportunity. And that was to embrace this break from reality and spend this strange time in history back out in nature, getting back in touch with her roots as an outdoor survivalist. And so at the end of that June, Sandra would sell her place in Maui and she would move to Madera County, California, which is located smack dab in the center of California, situated just south of Yosemite National Park and just north of the Sierra National Forest. Then on June 26th, after Sandra had gotten settled in her new place in California, she would contact her family and tell them that she planned on going on this extended solo camping trip in the Sierra National Forest and that she would be in touch with them in the coming weeks when she was back out. To Sandra, this trip was going to bring her lots of happiness and fulfillment and it was going to allow her to continue to adhere to quarantine guidelines because she'd be all alone. Shortly after speaking with her family on the 26th, Sandra loaded up all of her camping equipment into her silver Saab sedan, and then she would drive from her place south and then east a little over an hour until she was deep inside of the Sierra National Forest. At some point, she would leave the main road and she would hop onto a bumpy dirt road that kind of wound through the forest, and that road would bring her out to an area called the Johnson Meadows. The Johnson Meadows are absolutely gorgeous. It looks straight out of a postcard. It's basically a straight 
stretch of beautiful green meadows, and then around the perimeter of those meadows are the thick trees of the Sierra National Forest, and then beyond those trees are the snow-capped Sierra Mountains. But despite its beauty, the Johnson Meadows are actually fairly dangerous. It's a very isolated part of the Sierra National Forest, and there are lots of cougars and bears and other natural hazards in the area, so it's not really a place you go unless you're prepared to be there. And Sandra was certainly that, both in terms of her survival experience and the gear she brought with her. So when Sandra drove her car right up to the edge of the Johnson Meadows, she parked her car off to the side of the road so as not to block the road, and then she got out, she collected her things from the trunk, and then she threw it over her shoulder and began hiking into the middle of the Johnson Meadows to look for a place to set up her campsite. Six days later, on July 2nd, some hikers came out of the tree line into Johnson Meadows and began walking across the center of it. And as they're walking along, they notice up ahead what looks like a tent and a campsite. They don't see anybody near it, but they clearly see someone is camping in the middle of Johnson Meadows. And so this is totally not unusual. Lots of people go hiking and camping in this area. And so these hikers just began kind of creating a wide berth around this person's camp site because they didn't want to cut right through the middle of it as they went across the meadow. But as they're making this kind of wide berth around this campsite, they looked over at it, and as they passed by it, they noticed that the campsite was definitely abandoned, and it looked totally destroyed, like a tornado had crossed right across it. And so when they were parallel with this campsite, the hikers decided to actually go over and look at it and see what was going on. So they walked over to this campsite and they're looking around and they see there's a backpack that's clearly been dumped out and all of its contents are strewn around all over the ground. There's unopened cans of food, there's papers and documents, the tent is in ruins. I mean, the place is just a total mess. And so the hikers didn't really know what to make of this. They couldn't tell if a person had kind of intentionally ransacked the site or if maybe an animal had come through. But as a precaution, they marked down on their map where this destroyed campsite was, and then they hiked out of the forest. And when they were back in cell phone range, they called the Madera County Sheriff's Office and they reported the site. And so later that day, some Madera County Sheriffs made their way out to Johnson Meadows. And sure enough, the campsite is still there. It's still in ruins and it's still abandoned. And so they would search the campsite and they would find some ID cards and the name on those ID cards was Sandra Hughes. The sheriffs would leave the forest and get in touch with Sandra's family to find out if they knew why Sandra had left her campsite the way she had. But when Sandra's family heard about the state of Sandra's campsite, they had an immediate and definitive reaction to it. They told the sheriffs that Sandra was incredibly environmentally conscious and was very cleanly. And so she would never, ever leave her campsite looking that way on purpose. Something else had to have happened. The family would also tell the sheriffs that they had not spoken with Sandra since the 26th when she started her trip, and so they had no idea where she could be now. And so naturally, the family was concerned, the sheriffs were concerned, and so that day they filed an official missing person report. Over the next two days, a massive search was launched in Johnson Meadows and the surrounding area to look for Sandra. And so hundreds of people were out on foot, they had sniffer dogs out, there were helicopters in the air, and during the search, Church, the Madera County Sheriff's Office was interviewing anybody who was out there, hikers, campers, and asking them if they had had any contact with Sandra because Sandra was actually quite distinctive looking. Before she left for this trip, she had dyed her hair blue. But unfortunately, no one had seen Sandra, and despite this massive search effort over these first two days, nothing new was discovered that could lead authorities to where she had gone. But then on July 4th, so two days into her disappearance, Sandra Hughes was spotted. Some hikers were cutting through the Johnson Meadows area, and they saw this woman who was just standing off to the side of the meadow. She was by herself. She had no gear with her. She was barefoot. She had a black shirt on. She had blue jeans on. She had a bruise on her face, and she was just kind of standing there as if she was waiting for something. And as these hikers walked past her, they definitely noticed her, but she didn't wave them down. She didn't act distressed. She didn't look like she needed any help. 
They just kind of saw this person minding their own business, and they walked right on past her. It wasn't until those hikers got to the parking lot that they saw all these missing person flyers out for Sandra Hughes, and they would see the picture of Sandra, and they would see her distinctive blue hair, that they would say, oh my goodness, the barefoot woman we just saw standing in the forest is Sandra Hughes. And so the hikers called the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office got really jazzed up. They headed out to where they had claimed to have seen her, but there was no sign of her, and there was nothing left behind that would indicate where she might have gone. The following day, on July 5th, Sandra's vehicle was located, but Sandra was not with it. It was found five miles north of where her destroyed campsite was in Johnson Meadows, and the vehicle was actually at the bottom of a ravine, and this ravine was right next to a winding forest road. And so after looking at the damage on the front of the car, authorities believed Sandra was driving the car on that road and then hit a tree, and then she rolled off the embankment down to the bottom of the ravine. There was no blood inside the vehicle, so it wasn't immediately clear if this accident had actually done any physical harm to Sandra. But the most significant thing about the discovery of this vehicle was the state of Sandra's personal effects that had been in the vehicle. Clearly, after the vehicle had come to a stop at the bottom of the ravine, someone had pulled out all of the things inside of the car, all of Sandra's personal things, and kind of thrown them carelessly all over the forest floor, as if they were kind of rummaging through her car, looking for something, throwing things as they went. And the Madera County sheriffs couldn't help but think that this was eerily similar to how her campsite looked in Johnson Meadows, where all of her personal effects had just kind of been chucked all over the place. At this point, authorities did not believe Sandra was actively trying to evade them. Instead, they thought, you know, maybe Sandra got hurt, maybe back at the campsite or even during this car accident, and the injury has impaired her cognitive abilities, and so now, you know, maybe she's lost in the woods and doesn't know what's going on. There was some discussion about foul play maybe being involved, but that was largely discounted. And so a decision was made to just leave her vehicle where it was at the bottom of the ravine, thinking, you know, maybe Sandra is going to come back to this vehicle, and maybe that's why all these things have been strewn around, because she's coming back and looking for something. And so authorities left a note in the window of her vehicle that said, you know, hey, Sandra, we're looking for you. Please call this number if you see this. And then at the bottom of this note, it said, your family really misses you. The search for Sandra would continue over the next several days with a new focus around the area where the car had been found, but nothing new was discovered. Then, on the evening of July 12th, so one week after the vehicle was discovered, a team of searchers had made their way two and a half miles north of the vehicle, and they were actually inside of Yosemite National Park. They were barely inside, and they were right up along this lake called the Spotted Lake. Now, this is an area that's very difficult to get to. There are no main roads that get there. There are no main trails that get there. And so the searchers, they're up in this very rugged part of Yosemite, and as they're walking along with their flashlights out, they see a sleeping bag, and it's laying out right in the middle of the ground, in the middle of nowhere, and it looks like it's been used recently, and it would turn out that sleeping bag was Sandra's. But again, when they brought all the searchers out to that area, and they searched all around the spotted lake and all over this area, there was no sign of Sandra. At this point, authorities were totally baffled. On a map, Johnson Meadows, where her first campsite was, then her vehicle, and then this sleeping bag were all more or less in a straight line going south to north. It was almost like Sandra, from the day she went missing, had just begun slowly working her way to the north, but she was doing it without any equipment and most likely barefoot in an area that was steep and rugged and dangerous and full of cougars and bears. And so authorities knew if they didn't find her soon, even if she was doing this on purpose, she was likely going to succumb to the elements. The search for Sandra would continue for another week after the discovery of her sleeping bag. But by that time, by July 20th, there hadn't been any new developments. No one had seen Sandra. There were no new leads. And so unfortunately, the authorities had to scale back their search. About three weeks later, on August 9th, two hunters were driving down this very desolate forest road located several miles to the east of where Sandra's car had been found. And as they're driving along, they turn this corner, and as soon as they do, they look up ahead, and they see there's this woman. Now, she's not standing on the road or even right next to the road. She's kind of tucked up a ways on this hillside in the trees, and she's leaning up against a tree. 
And so the hunters are looking at her and they're seeing that she's got no equipment with her. There's no backpack, there's nothing, no tent, and there's no other people anywhere. I mean, they're in a very isolated part of this forest and it's odd to see people here to begin with, let alone this woman who's just kind of casually standing up against a tree. And so the hunters, they're like, okay, let's drive up and see if she needs something. And so they pull up right up alongside her. She's still, you know, 10, 15 feet away from them, tucked up in the trees. And so they roll their windows down and they're looking up at her, trying to kind of flag her and get her attention. But the woman is not paying attention to them at all. She just continues to prop herself up against this tree and just kind of stares off into the distance. And so the hunters, they're looking up at her thinking, what's going on with this woman? And they kind of called out to her. They tried to wave her down, but there was nothing. There was no interactions with them. And so ultimately the hunters thought, okay, well, we don't know what this woman's doing, but it seems like she's here on purpose and she doesn't seem like she's in distress. She doesn't look hurt. And so they just decided to carry on. And so they drove off. And then later that day, they would see one of the missing person flyers for Sandra Hughes. And they saw the blue hair in the picture. And they were like, oh my goodness, the woman we saw standing up against the tree in the middle of the forest was that woman, Sandra Hughes. The hunters would contact the Madera County Sheriff's Office and report the sighting, and they would describe Sandra as looking slightly thinner than the picture of her on her missing person flyer, and they would also say she was wearing overalls and a floral t-shirt which was interesting to sheriffs because the last time Sandra was sighted, which was on July 4th, when those hikers had seen her barefoot with a bruise on her face near Johnson Meadows, she had been wearing a black shirt and blue jeans. And so clearly she had changed her outfit, but that didn't really make any sense because she had left all of her things at the campsite and her car. And so the whole situation was just totally weird to the sheriffs. But regardless, they headed out to that road where the hunters had seen Sandra. But like always, Sandra was not there and there was no sign she had ever been there. After this, Sandra's case went cold. And so authorities and her family began to brace for the reality that they likely would never see her again. But there was one more terrifying twist coming. A year later, on Wednesday, July 21st, 2021, Jake Gorba, his wife Victoria, and their three young children were driving in Jake's off-roading vehicle up the steep forest road in the middle of Sierra National Forest on their way to the top of Shut Eye Peak. Shut Eye Peak is a mountain in the Sierra National Forest with stunning panoramic views from the top, and it's located about five miles to the south of Johnson Meadows, where Sandra's first campsite was discovered. So Jake and his family, they're driving their way up this long, bumpy, winding forest road, making their way towards the top of Shut Eye Peak. And when they get about halfway, the kids in the back start complaining that they're hungry. And so Jake and Victoria, they decide, you know what, let's just pull over at the next natural stopping point and we'll have a quick lunch and then we'll continue on the rest of the way. And as luck would have it, the road they were on would actually level off and lead them to this kind of short, flat section of the mountain. And in this flat section was this beautiful little meadow that butted up against some trees. And so Jake and his wife thought, this is a great place to stop and have a little picnic. And so he pulled his truck over on the side of the road. He parked it, he turned the engine off, and then as Jake and his wife are kind of gathering up their things before they get out of the vehicle to go prepare this picnic lunch, they hear their three-year-old son named Caden, who's in the back seat right near a window, start talking. And so Jake and Victoria instinctively turned around to see who Caden was talking to, and they saw Caden was not talking to himself, he was not talking to his siblings, he was turned and looking out his open window, looking across this small meadow into the forest, engaged in some sort of intense conversation with somebody outside. And so Jake and Victoria, they see their son and they look out the window in the direction he's looking and talking and they don't see anyone. And so Victoria, she looks at her son and goes, Caden, who are you talking to? And what he would say to her would send goosebumps all over her body. And in fact, what would happen over the next several minutes from that point onward was so unsettling that Jake and Victoria decided, you know what, we're not going to the top of Shut Eye Peak. We're turning around and we're leaving. And so they would speed out of the forest and they would get back home. And that night, Victoria would make a Facebook post about what her son said and this terrifying ordeal they experienced on Shut Eye Peak. And she would post it. And that night, the Madera County Sheriff's Office would reach out to Victoria via a Facebook message. And they would tell her, hey, we saw your post. Can we please speak to you and your son? 
And so the next day, the sheriffs met up with the Gorba family, and after speaking with Caden and hearing what he had to say, they would leave that exchange just as unsettled as Caden's parents. The day before, when Victoria turned around and looked at Caden and said, who are you talking to? Caden would turn away from the window and look at his mom, and he would say, there's a woman out there and she needs our help. And he starts pointing out the window. And so again, Jake and Victoria, they look from their son back out the window into the tree line, which is where Caden is pointing, and they don't see anyone. And so they turn back to Caden and they say, honey, we don't see anyone out there. And Caden, at this point, he becomes emphatic. And he says, mom, you gotta trust me. She's right there. She needs our help. She's lying face down. Her legs are straight up and she's dead. And so at this point, Victoria and Jake are looking at their son thinking, what's going on here? Jake promptly hops out of the car and just starts running into the woods to see what's going on. Is there a person out here? But he's out there looking around and there's no one. And while he's out there, his son is pointing in the direction of where he is, claiming there's this woman right near him. And so Jake's looking around thinking, there's no one out here. I have no idea what my son's on about. And so he's spooked. He runs back to the car. And when he gets inside, Caden is still looking out the window. He's pointing and he's talking to this dead woman that needs their help. And so Jake and Victoria, they were horrified. They turned around, they left. And then that night when Victoria made that Facebook post, she included in the post what this woman apparently looked like based on what Caden said. And what Caden said was she had a black t-shirt on, blue jeans on, and blue hair. And so when the Madera County Sheriff's Office saw this post that described seeing a person in a black shirt, blue jeans, and blue hair, they knew that description matched Sandra Hughes. And so when the sheriffs met up with the Gorba family, they brought with them a lineup of several women, and they went right up to Caden, and without giving him any extra information, they just showed him all these pictures of all these women. And they said, Caden, can you identify in any of these pictures the woman you saw in the woods? And Caden looks at these pictures, and he picks out three pictures. All three are Sandra Hughes. The sheriffs, along with Caden and his father, they would return to that section of Shut Eye Peak to search the tree line near the meadow to see if there was any sign of Sandra or any indication that she had been there. But like always, there was nothing. As of today, we still have no idea where Sandra is or what happened to her, and nobody has any idea what to make of the very strange sightings of her that occurred after she went missing. It's all just one big mystery. If anyone has any information about Sandra Hughes, you are encouraged to contact the Madera County Sheriff's Office. The number is right here and also in the description. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please sign the like button up for your very friendly, casual, slow machine pitch baseball league. But when they're up at bat, switch out the machine for a grenade launcher. On July 18th, 2019, 28-year-old Andrew Harper scrawled a little note inside of a card, and then he folded the card up, he slipped it into its envelope, and he handed that envelope off to a nearby friend. And this friend, after getting this envelope and Andrew's directions for what to do with it, he left Andrew's room and began walking down the hall all the way towards the other side of the Ardington house. The Ardington House, where they were staying, is this beautiful mansion built in the 1700s that sits on about 30 acres of gardens and parklands, and it's located about an hour west of London in the English countryside. Once Andrew's friend, with this letter in hand, had walked all the way across the mansion and had found the room he was looking for, he gently knocked on the door, and then after being let inside, he made his way right over to 28-year-old Lissy Beckett, and he handed her the envelope. Lissy and Andrew had grown up in the same town of Wallingford, which is a small rural town about 10 miles away from where they were, the Ardington House. And from the time Lissy and Andrew had met each other when they were 15 years old, they had become totally inseparable. It was truly love at first sight. And now, 13 years later, 
they were finally getting married. And so Lissy, after getting this envelope, she saw the writing on the outside of it and knew it was from her fiance. And so she smiled, she opens up this letter and she reads what's inside. And it just said, life is slippery. Here, take my hand. While on the surface, this little note seemed like nothing more than a romantic gesture from Andrew, in reality, those seven words contained in that card were a great representation of who Andrew really was. He was a protector. Ever since Lizzie could remember, Andrew had always been so concerned with her safety. And for that matter, anybody around Andrew, Andrew was just worried about and wanted to make sure everybody was taken care of. And as Andrew got older and grew to be this massive six foot five inch tall man, his natural inclination to protect other people only became more pronounced. While Andrew was known for being incredibly charming and friendly and approachable, at a moment's notice, he could flip the switch and literally step in and use his big frame to protect anybody that needed protecting, no questions asked. And so it came as no shock to Lissy or really anybody who knew Andrew when Andrew, at the age of 19, became a special constable or volunteer police officer for the Timms Valley Police Department. This police department was the same one that oversaw Wallingford, where he and Lissy had grown up, and also the surrounding areas. And just a year after becoming a special constable, Andrew had done such an amazing job that he was hired on by the Timms Valley Police Department to be a regular constable, so a full-fledged police officer. And over the following years that he was a regular constable, Andrew's hard work and dedication would quickly make him one of the most well-respected and well-liked police officers on the force. In fact, just a few weeks before he sent off that letter to Lissy on the day of their wedding, Andrew had been promoted. He had been assigned to the road policing unit within the Timms Valley Police Department. And what that meant was, in addition to a host of new responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis, Andrew would now become one of the police officers who would immediately respond to any emergency call that came in. He was basically a front lines police officer now. And so of course, this meant Andrew's job just became a lot more dangerous. But for Andrew, that didn't matter at all because to him, the most important thing was protecting people in need. And so this promotion just gave him a bigger opportunity to do that. And so Lissy, after reading this little note that Andrew had just sent her, she set it down on the table and now with a big grin on her face, she finished getting ready. And then that afternoon, she and Andrew would walk down the aisle and they would say, I do in front of their families and their closest friends. And then that evening after the newlyweds had had their first dance as a married couple, they would tell each other that this was the happiest day of their lives. 28 days later, on August 15th, Andrew, along with his partner, who also was named Andrew, his name was Andrew Shaw, they were conducting a surveillance operation in a town called Reading. Reading is a town about 30 minutes south of Wallingford. Just after 11 p.m., the men finally decided it was time to shut down their operation and head back home. Their shift had actually ended four hours earlier, but being hardworking and diligent police officers, they had worked overtime because they knew it would help their unit. But now at 11 p.m., they were totally exhausted. And so as they're kind of yawning and packing up their things, Shaw, who was driving, would fire up the engine of the unmarked BMW car they were in. And then once it was on, he would pull away from the curb and they would start heading north. At the same time, a very distressed man who lived not far from where Andrew Andrew and Shaw had just been doing surveillance, he called 999 and he told the dispatcher that just a few moments ago, this gray sedan had pulled up his driveway and stopped right outside of his property. Now, this man's property was off of a road called Admore Lane, which was this winding one lane country road that had very little traffic and there was not that many properties off of it. And so for anybody to pull on to this man's property would have caught his attention, let alone a car pulling onto his property in the middle of the night. And so as soon as the man had seen these headlights coming up his driveway, he had gone to the window and watched, wondering, you know, what is this person doing? Had they turned onto the wrong property? You know, are they gonna turn around and leave? But 
to his horror, once this car had stopped right outside of his house, three masked men who were carrying weapons of some kind got out of the vehicle. And so at that point, the man had frantically dialed 999. And as he's trying to describe the situation to the dispatcher, he suddenly tells the dispatcher as he's looking out the window that he thinks these men are here to steal his quad bike. His quad bike was parked right outside of his detached garage and he saw them walking towards it. And so he tells the dispatcher, who's already told him that police are on the way, he tells the dispatcher, I can't wait any longer. I'm going out to confront them and stop them from stealing my bike. The dispatcher yells at him not to and says they have weapons, stay in your house but this guy's not listening. And so he runs to his front door, he opens the front door up, but by the time he's looking outside, the gray car, the three masked men, they're all gone, and so too is his quad bike. And so he goes back in the house, he's talking to the dispatcher, and the dispatcher says, look, just stay at your house, the police are on the way, they will intercept that car, they'll get your quad bike back. And so seconds later, a call went out over the radio to Tim's Valley Police to go and intercept this gray car on Admore Lane. So whoever was closest, go over there, but be advised the occupants of this car are three masked men that are armed and dangerous. Now, Andrew and Shaw, when they heard this call, they would have known that they were not the only officers that could have taken this call. And they also would have known that they've been off the clock now for like four and a half hours. There was no expectation that they would continue to work and go take this call. But they didn't care at all. When that call came across, the only thing they thought about was, do your job. And so Shaw, he whips the car around and he speeds towards Admore Lane and he pulls off of the main road called the A4. He gets onto Admore Lane and he starts driving north. Now, as soon as they turned onto that road, their vehicle effectively blocked the way for anybody coming the other direction. And so at this point, they're expecting this gray car full of these masked men to be coming in their direction, and they are now blocking the way. And so Andrew and Shaw, as soon as they get on that road, they know a close quarters confrontation is almost guaranteed. But when you listen to the dash cam footage from the front of their vehicle that picked up the voices of Andrew and Shaw as they turn onto this road, there is no nerves, there's no fear, there's no hesitation. They are calm as can be. This is what they have trained for. They were ready. And so Shaw, he's making his way up this winding road. It's totally pitch black. The trees are practically on top of the road. It's like a tunnel of trees. And so they're driving along this road. And then all of a sudden, up in the distance, you can see on the dash cam footage, you see headlights bombing toward them. They're way off in the distance. And then all of a sudden, that car, these headlights, they come flooring out right in front of them. And both cars come to a screeching stop. You can hear the screeching of the brakes on the dash cam footage. And so this car in front of them comes comes to a full stop and Shaw, he stops, but then he moves up just a little bit closer before fully stopping the car. And so now the two cars are only maybe 10 or 15 feet apart. At this point, it's important to understand that the vehicle that Shaw and Andrew were in was an unmarked car and they had intentionally not put on their blue lights as they're cruising up this road because they didn't want the suspects to see the blue lights in the distance and turn around and get away. And so now they've come face to face and so Andrew Andrew and Shaw, they're looking at this vehicle and they can see that one, it's a gray sedan, so it matches the description of the car they're looking for. And two, behind this gray sedan is what looks like a quad bike that they are towing. And so they know this is the car they were looking for. It's on Admore Lane. This is going to be it. And so Shaw, he flips on the blue lights and Andrew, who's in the passenger seat, he opens the door and begins yelling at the occupants to stay where they are. But they don't listen because now the masked men in the gray car, they know they've been caught. There's police right in front of them. And so suddenly, one of the masked men in the back seat of this car, he leaps out of the vehicle and he runs around to the back of the gray car and he unhooks the quad bike. And then the gray car, without even waiting for this third masked man to get back inside, it just begins driving forward on the left side of Shaw and Andrew, basically trying to drive around them, despite the fact there's nowhere to drive. It's a 
ditch on either side of the road. But obviously, these guys are desperate and willing to do anything to get away. And so this gray car has driven down into this ditch before Andrew and Shaw could do anything. And then the third masked man, who's realizing he's being left behind, he starts running around the right side of the police car. So he's trying to go around the other way. And amazingly, as soon as the third masked man made it around to the back of the police car, the gray car somehow managed to pop out of the ditch and got back onto the road. And it starts driving away from Shaw and Andrew. And as they're driving away, the third masked man is just on the road running after them. And so Andrew, seeing an opportunity to potentially grab this third masked man that was out on foot, he jumps out of the police car, he turns and starts running down the road after the suspects. And so Shaw, he doesn't have enough space on this road to turn around and drive after them. And so all he could do was put the car into reverse and then look over his shoulder and start driving in reverse after them. And so as Shaw is driving backwards down this road, he can see out of his rear window, Andrew, who is chasing the third masked man, who is chasing the gray car. And so we can see all this happening out his back window. And then something totally strange that just defied logic happened. The third masked man suddenly leaps as if he's trying to jump into the moving car. And at the same time, Andrew, who's closed the distance on him, kind of lunges for the third masked man. And then just as suddenly as these two maneuvers have happened, both men just vanish. And then the gray car just drives away and disappears. And so Shaw, he's watching this happening and he has no idea what he's just witnessed. He's thinking, where did Andrew go? Where'd the third masked man go? What's happened? But he still can only drive in reverse. And so he's just driving and driving. And then finally, he reaches a point in the road that's just wide enough that he's able to turn the car around. And as he's doing that, you hear over dispatch that someone is asking Shaw, what's going on? Where are you? And all Shaw is able to say is, my partner, Andrew, has gotten out of the vehicle and I lost him. I don't know where he is. And so after Shaw has turned the vehicle around, he begins driving now facing the proper direction. And as he's driving down this creepy dark road, you don't see anything. It's eerily quiet. Andrew's nowhere to be found. The car is nowhere to be found. The third masked man, there's no one. And so Shaw is just driving down the road, hoping that as he makes one turn or the next, he's gonna see his partner just kind of running on the road somewhere, but he doesn't. But as he's driving along, what Shaw didn't realize was that there were things in the road that belonged to Andrew. They were kind of small, so he didn't see them. But the footage would later reveal that it was almost like there was this trail of Andrew's things kind of littered all over the road. There was his wallet, then there was his badge, then there was his license and other ID cards, and then there was his glove, and then there was this piece of plastic that looked like it belonged on Andrew's vest. And then a little farther down the road, because Shaw is still driving, and scanning for his partner and scanning for anything and there's just nothing. As he's driving along, he would in real time notice something of Andrew's and it was Andrew's stab vest that he wore over his chest. And so he stops the vehicle and he gets out and again, he's on this totally pitch black road where it's weirdly quiet and he's walking up and he grabs the vest, he comes back into his vehicle and he puts it down inside of his car and at this point, over the radio, people are asking Shaw, you know, what's going on? Where are you? And you hear in Shaw Shaw's voice, a bit of panic, as he's like, I've found Andrew's stab vest. It was on the side of the road. And he can't make sense of that. He has no idea why it's there. And dispatch, they don't know what to make of that. And so Shaw just continued driving down this road, thinking to himself, what's happening here? Meanwhile, less than a mile away at the end of Admore Lane, where it joined up with A4, which is where Andrew and Shaw had originally come in, two other Tim's Valley police cars had arrived at that intersection. They had gone there specifically to try to intercept this gray car as they fled. And so they're sitting at this intersection and they're looking up Admore Lane and they see headlights bombing towards them. It's the gray car and the gray car comes speeding out onto A4. It makes a hard turn and it's speeds away from these two police cars. And so one of these two police cars that were waiting out on the A4, one of them takes off following the gray car. But the other police car, they stay right there because unbelievably, they had just spotted Andrew. 
It would turn out when Shaw first put the BMW into reverse and he began going in reverse towards his partner who was chasing the third masked man who was chasing the gray car. When he was doing that and he was watching out his back window and he saw the third masked man jump and then disappear and then Andrew disappeared, that was not a figment of his imagination. That really happened. The third masked man had attempted to jump into the moving vehicle and he had been successful. As for Andrew, why he suddenly vanished, the reason for that is truly horrific. The three masked men were 18-year-old Henry Long and 17-year-olds Albert Bowers and Jesse Cole. All three of them, prior to this night, had fairly extensive criminal records, and they proudly referred to themselves as career thieves, which basically just meant they spent all day and all night stealing from people. And so that night, they had gone out with the intention of stealing that man's quad bike. It's unclear how they knew he had a quad bike, but they definitely showed up prepared because they knew they would have to get onto his property and very quickly tow that bike out of there before the homeowner could stop them. And so they had attached this long, very thick rope to the back of their gray car. It was basically like this big loop of rope, almost like a lasso. And so when they pulled up onto that man's property, they backed up to the quad bike and they looped that stretch of rope over the handlebars of this quad bike. And then all three of them piled back into the gray car and they sped off with the quad bike in tow. But when they were on Admore Lane and came face to face with Andrew and Shaw and realized those are police officers and were caught, the third masked man, AKA Jesse Cole, he hopped out of the gray car, he ran around to the back and he unhooked the loop of rope from this quad bike, ditching the quad bike by the side of the road so that it would be easier for the gray car to make their getaway. And so once it was free, the gray car kind of took off without Jesse. And so Jesse ran around the cop car, but Jesse would get back up to the side of the gray car and he would leap into the window. And as soon as he was inside and Henry, who was driving, he knew he was inside, so they're all good. Henry hit the gas and who was standing with both feet inside of that loop of rope dangling off the back of the gray car when the gray car suddenly accelerated? Andrew Harper. Andrew was swept off of his feet as the rope grabbed onto his legs, and so his head came back and smashed into the ground, and then he was dragged for 91 seconds at an average speed of 42 and a half miles per hour down Admore Lane. It was only after he had been dragged for over a mile, whipping violently side to side, smashing not only into the ground, but into trees and fence posts and shrubs, just getting destroyed on this road, that finally, when they pulled off of Admore Lane and got onto A4, that turn swung Andrew around and he smashed into a curb that dislodged him from the rope and sent him careening into traffic. At that point, one of those two police cars took off after the gray car in pursuit but the other car, they saw Andrew as he was thrown off the back of the gray car and launched onto A4. Now, initially, they actually thought that the suspects were just hauling a dead deer behind them because it looked like a bloody deer carcass was dangling behind the car. But when they ran up to see what it was, they saw it was their colleague, it was Andrew. And so immediately they tried to save his life, but Andrew's injuries were catastrophic. He had been destroyed. And so Andrew Harper would die at 11.45 p.m. on the side of the A4, about 20 minutes after he and his partner had so selflessly agreed to go after this car despite the fact they didn't have to. The three killers were arrested about one hour after Andrew had died. A police helicopter had spotted their car parked amongst some buildings about four miles away from where Andrew was found. During their trial, the three teens would say they had no idea that Andrew was attached to that tow rope as they sped down Admore Lane. This is despite the fact that the prosecution, they went out and recreated the exact scene that played out on Admore Lane. They used the same car, they used the same tow rope, and they used a very lifelike dummy that was the same size as Andrew Harper. It was six foot five, 200 pounds, and they strapped it on the back of the car, and they drove the same mile stretch to see what it would be like to drive 
with Andrew attached to the back. And these experts that went through this recreation over and over and over again, they said the same thing. It was nearly impossible to drive the car because as soon as the dummy would start to shift one way or the other, it would tug and pull on this little gray car. And so handling this car would have been a nightmare, not to mention the fact that the sound of Andrew grinding against the cement and smashing into trees and posts would have been extremely loud. And so the prosecution attested that there was absolutely no way that those three teens wouldn't have known that there was a person connected to the back of their car. Also, the prosecution said that all along Admore Lane, they found blood on both sides of the road, high up into bushes and on trees, indicating that as Henry had driven along with Andrew behind him, he must have been swerving violently side to side most likely, at least according to the prosecution, to try to dislodge the person that was stuck on the back of his car. But the three teens never changed their story. They also never once said they regretted what they did. They showed absolutely no remorse. And when the verdict was read, and these three teens were not found guilty of murder. They were found guilty of manslaughter, but everybody knew that was significantly better because the sentences were so much shorter. When that verdict came back, these three teens were punching the air and cheering and laughing, just making a complete spectacle out of it. And then after being led out of the courthouse with the devastated family of Andrew Harper basically watching them, they were smirking and smiling at the cameras and waving and just treating the whole thing like it was one big joke. Still to this day, none of them have apologized or expressed any regret or remorse about what happened. In fact, two of the killers, Jesse and Albert, they've come out publicly and said they're going to write a book about this crime, about killing Andrew Harper, and there's no indication that this book is being written because they feel bad. It's almost certainly being written because it's an opportunity to make money. Following the verdict, Andrew's wife, Lissy, who was totally devastated not only by the loss of her husband, but also by what she viewed as total injustice with regards to the fact that these three killers had not been convicted of murder, she would go on to lobby for years to pass a a brand new law called Harper's Law that would give an automatic life sentence to any criminal that killed an emergency worker while they were committing a crime, meaning this law would not differentiate between whether it was manslaughter or murder. If you killed an emergency worker while committing a crime, you're going to jail for life. And this year, Harper's Law was passed. However, it will have no effect on the sentences of Andrew Harper's killers. Henry would be sentenced to 16 years in prison and the other two, Albert and Jesse, would be sentenced to 13 years in prison each. All three of them will be eligible for parole by the time they are 28 years old, which is the same age that Andrew was when they killed him. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please remove the prong from all of the like buttons belts. On the morning of Sunday, June 17th, 2018, 35-year-old Tristan Baudet pulled his phone out of his pocket to check the weather forecast for Orange County, California. Orange County is this beautiful suburb located right between Los Angeles and San Diego. And this beautiful suburb is where Tristan and his wife, 36-year-old Erica Wu, and their two young daughters, aged two and four, called home. And on this day, which was Father's Day, Tristan had gotten up early to check the weather to make sure it was going to be clear that day because he really wanted to take his family out for a fun beach day to celebrate his holiday. And he was in luck because when his app loaded, it showed that Orange County was going to be beautiful and clear all day. Although, even if the weather had come back as rainy and horrible and cold, Tristan was the kind of person who still would have wanted to go to the beach. Because for Tristan, anything outdoors was really awesome. That was his happy place, being out in nature. Whether it was going to the beach or going hiking or camping or just throwing a frisbee around outside, he didn't care. If he was outside, 
He was good with it. And even though his daughters were still very young, they both already had totally fallen in love with nature just like their dad had, which made Tristan just so happy because now he had these two little sidekicks that would go with him on all of his outdoor adventures. As for Tristan's wife, Erica, she did love the outdoors, but maybe not as much as Tristan did. But that was okay with Tristan because all he would do is make little adjustments to his adventures to make it more bearable for Erica. Like whenever they went camping, Tristan would totally rough it in a tent right on the ground, but he would bring along a big full-size blow-up mattress for his wife. And this was something that Erica just adored about Tristan. Not that he literally waited on her hand and foot, but rather that Tristan just kind of went with the flow. If his wife wanted a blow up mattress, that was fine. You know, it didn't matter to him. That was just who he was. He just, he didn't judge people. He just, he was at peace with the world. And in fact, it was that character trait that had originally attracted Erica to Tristan. Erica had met Tristan back in high school when some mutual friends had set them up. Tristan didn't have a date to a dance at a school, and so the friends were kind of like, Erica, go with him. And so Erica would agree to go. And on the night, she actually met Tristan for the first time. She's laying eyes on him for the first time. He was a sight to behold. The summer prior, he had sprouted up like four inches or so. So he's super tall, but his body hadn't quite filled out yet. So he's super lanky looking and he was totally overdressed for this dance. He had on this full tuxedo and he was not remotely self-conscious. He was only psyched to have a date to this dance. And during this dance, Tristan would just totally rock that tuxedo in all of his gangly glory as if this tuxedo was made for him. And he would really try hard to make sure that Erica had a good time with him. And she totally did. And so after this dance was over, the pair was inseparable. Erica would go on to study at Stanford and would become an OBGYN doctor. As for Tristan, he would become this wildly successful, widely published scientist with a patent related to vaccine delivery. However, in typical Tristan fashion, he didn't care at all about his resume. It didn't matter that it was completely stacked. I mean, on paper, this guy was just unbelievable. But Tristan never changed his personality. He never changed anything about himself. In fact, his scientist colleagues who adored him, they used to think it was hysterical that this brilliant chemist who was on the cutting edge of various cancer treatments and all this crazy research, that guy was actually this big mellow type person who wandered around the lab and started most of his sentences with, dude, by early afternoon on that Father's Day in 2018, Erica and Tristan and their two little girls had made their way to a local beach and Erica had found herself sitting in a beach chair reading a book and Tristan and the girls had set up a sunshade right down where the water broke and they were digging in the sand. And so over the course of that afternoon, Erica, she's reading her book and periodically she would look up and she would see Tristan and the girls digging in the sand or making sand castles. And then at some point, Tristan and the girls, they would get up and abandon their dig site and they would run into the water and then they would run back to shore right as the waves were breaking, trying to kind of escape the waves. And the two little girls thought this was so much fun and they were laughing hysterically and screeching with excitement as the waves crashed at their ankles. These are tiny little waves. And at some point, Erica, she's looking up watching this and she sees her two little girls having a blast and she sees her husband flash her this big grin because he knows this is totally funny. And at that moment, Erica suddenly felt herself feel something that she didn't always feel these days. And that was just contentedness, happiness. Tristan, because he was this totally laid back guy, he was able to just kind of enjoy life as it came to him. But Erica, she couldn't do that. She was a constant worrier. And that was largely because when she was just eight years old, she lost her father. And it was this totally traumatic experience that really upset her childhood. It was just devastating for the family. And so ever since then, she had developed this very real paranoia that no matter how good her life was, that at any second, it was gonna be ruined by something horrible happening to her. But as she sat in this chair, watching her husband smiling at her and seeing her kids playing with him, 
it was just this perfect moment. And so Erica would put the book down and she would get up and run into the surf to be with her family. Little did she know, something horrible was about to happen. Four days later, on June 21st, Erica was home studying for this big medical exam she was scheduled to take the next day. But at the house with her was her husband and her two little girls. And so the house was totally chaotic and loud. And it was obvious to Tristan as he looked over at his wife that she was really struggling to focus. And Tristan also knew that they were a week away from moving. They were moving to San Francisco. They had just put a deposit down on a house. They had some family up there. So it was a smart move to make, but they still had a lot to do for this move. And so Tristan's looking at his wife, knowing that, you know, the stress levels have got to be through the roof for her. And so Tristan decided he would just take the girls and head out for the weekend to make sure Erica had the time and space she needed to prepare for this test and also just maybe to be alone and have some peace and quiet. And so Tristan made a couple of phone calls. And then after he was done, he talked to Erica and he told her that he had just made reservations at this campsite up in Malibu, California. Malibu is another beautiful Southern California town located about an hour and a half north of Orange County. It's where a lot of celebrities live. It's a very rich part of California. And he tells Erica that he had made reservations in this campground that's out there and that he had called his brother-in-law named Scott, who had two young kids himself, ages three and five, and they were all going to go there together and spend the weekend at this campsite. Now, Erica Erica was very thankful for her husband for being willing to do this because she did need the time and space to study, but she immediately was just concerned about it because, you know, Tristan, he would take the girls and go out on all sorts of adventures all the time, but he had never gone camping overnight without her there, and so her reaction was to worry about it. But Tristan, who knew his wife very well, told her, don't worry, I will take great care of the kids. It's a place that's totally public. It's an amazing campground. There's loads of people around. It's totally safe. And so eventually Erica was convinced. And so Tristan began packing the car with all the camping supplies and the kids' toys and the kids' bikes. And as he's doing that, and the girls are really excited about this camping trip, Erica still found herself thinking, you know, I hope they cancel this trip because she just couldn't help feeling like something bad was about to happen to them. But Tristan did not cancel the trip. And after the car was all packed and the girls had been tucked into their car seats in the back seat, Tristan kissed Erica goodbye and said he would see her in a couple of days and good luck on your test tomorrow. And with that, Tristan hopped into the car, he backed out of the driveway and Erica watched as he pulled up the road and headed north towards Malibu. After studying well into the night, Erica finally went to sleep. And then the next morning, she got up early because she was nervous about the test. She was anxious about her husband and her kids. And so she's up early. She looks at her clock and she sees it's 6.45 in the morning. And there was no reason for anybody to be knocking on her door that early in the morning. Maybe unless it was Tristan, but he wouldn't be knocking on the door. He'd just be coming inside. And so apprehensively, she walked out of her room and went to the front of the house. And then she opened the front door. And as soon as she saw who was standing there, she knew something was wrong. Erica would later reflect on this moment when she opened the door. And even though it didn't make sense and it was irrational, she would sometimes think to herself, what if I had just never opened the door? Would this nightmare have really happened? But Erica did open the door, and standing out there was her sister-in-law, Priscilla, who was there unannounced. She lived an hour and a half away, and she looked very frazzled and upset. And she would give Erica absolutely heartbreaking news. News that was so earth-shattering that Erica literally couldn't comprehend it. Like, this cannot be true. There literally has to be a mistake. But there was no mistake. Erica would not take her medical exam that day. Instead, she would hop into the car with Priscilla and they would drive to Malibu. The day before, Tristan and his two little girls, after driving for about an hour and a half, arrived in Malibu at the entrance to the Malibu Creek State Park. Now, when most people think of Malibu, they just think of the beautiful properties lining the beach. They think of celebrities and rich people and exclusivity. And that's all true, but what a lot of people don't know about Malibu is that just outside of the kind of main Malibu area is this totally wild area, this very rugged terrain, all these canyons, all these heavily forested areas. It all kind of butts up against the outside of Malibu. And in this totally rugged area is where the Malibu Creek State Park is. So Tristan and Scott, they arrive at the gates of this park that leads into this wilderness and they check in with the park rangers up front 
front and they are directed to their respective campsites that they had reserved. They had reserved two sites right next to each other. And all a campsite is usually is just a square little plot of land with nothing in it. And it's a place where you put your tent on and sometimes there's a fire pit inside of it. It's really sparse. And so Tristan and Scott, they thank the park ranger. They drive all the way across the campgrounds. They get to their designated spots. And right away, Tristan's like, these are just not very good campsites. They were located right near the porta potties, so it kind of smelled bad, and there was lots of foot traffic right in front of their sites, and their site was kind of at a tilt too, so just overall it was not ideal. And so Tristan said this to Scott, and Scott decided he would just go talk to the park rangers again and see if they could change their campsites. And so he went to the front, talks to the park ranger, and they say, no problem, there's actually two open campsites on the other side of the park, we'll just swap your reservation. And so Tristan and Scott and the kids, they make their way to these other two campsites, and these are perfect. They're kind of tucked up at the base of this huge canyon. There are no porta potties nearby, so no foot traffic. It's very private, and the land was totally flat. And so the men are totally happy with this, and they start getting their stuff out of their vehicles and setting up their tents, and the kids are running around playing and riding their little bikes around. And then after their campsites were mostly set up, Scott and Tristan made a fire in the fire pit that was located roughly between where the two tents had been set up. And so Scott was sleeping with his two sons in his tent and Tristan would be sleeping with his two girls in his tent. And so they get this big fire going and then all the kids and the adults, they sit around the fire and they start roasting hot dogs and making s'mores, which is marshmallow, chocolate, and graham cracker. And the dads are telling funny jokes and spooky stories too. And before long, the kids are just totally exhausted. And so Scott and Tristan both take their kids and put them to bed inside of their tents. And then after the kids are tucked in, the two men come back to the fire and Tristan, who had packed pre-made cocktails, he pulls those out and he shares one with Scott. And then the two men just enjoyed each other's company, you know, sat around the campfire, chatted for a while. It was mostly Tristan talking about his upcoming move to San Francisco, but Scott was happy to just listen. And then at some point, the two men were just totally exhausted and they decided it was time for them to go to bed. And so they put out the fire. Scott would hug Tristan and tell him that he loved him. And then the two men would leave the campfire and go to their respective tents. As Scott climbed into his tent with his two sons, he turned and looked out the open flap of his tent across the fire pit towards Tristan's tent. And he saw Tristan climb into the tent with his girls. And so after he sees Tristan get into his tent, Scott zips up his own tent and he lies down. And within 10 or 15 minutes, Scott is fast asleep. Just before sunrise the next day, so around 4.45 a.m., Scott suddenly woke up. He thought he heard a loud sound, but he couldn't place the sound. And so he's just laying there, it's still dark outside. And as he's kind of getting his bearings, he realizes one of Tristan's daughters is crying in her tent. Now, this was not cause for alarm necessarily because Scott just thought, you know, whatever she was upset about, Tristan would certainly calm her down any minute and she'd be okay. But as Scott was laying there with his two sons sleeping right next to him, Tristan's daughter just continued to cry. Now, Tristan was a famously heavy sleeper. And so Scott was thinking, okay, you know, he just must not be awake. And so that's why he's not able to comfort his daughter. And so Scott would carefully get up. He'd unzip his tent. You know, he'd be careful not to step on his sons. He went outside and outside it's cold, it's dark. He cannot see inside of Tristan's tent. There's no windows on it. And so he just walks over and by the time he gets to the tent, he can hear clear as day, Tristan's daughter is still crying. And so Scott kind of loudly, but still whispering says, hey, Tristan, Tristan, wake up. But Tristan doesn't wake up. And so with Tristan's daughter still crying right on the other side of the nylon of this tent, Scott decides to just open the tent up and look inside. And so he walks around to the front of the tent. He unzips the tent and he looks inside. Now it's too dark. He can't really tell what he's looking at, but even with the minimal light, he could tell that Tristan was clearly still sleeping right in the middle of the tent. And positioned on either side of him was his two-year-old daughter and his four-year-old daughter. And from the looks of it, the two-year-old was crying and the four-year-old who was also whimpering was doing her best to comfort the two-year-old. And so Scott's looking in, wondering what's going on, when the two little girls, they turn and look up at Scott, and when they see him, they just start saying, wet, wet, wet. Now Scott doesn't know what they're talking about, he's starting to get a little bit flustered because he thinks something's wrong, and so he reaches in and just starts shaking Tristan, saying, hey, wake up. But as soon as he did that, he could tell Tristan's not sleeping. Tristan is dead, and his two little girls are sitting in a pool of his blood. Right before Scott had woken up, 
Someone who was standing near the campsite had fired a gun several times, and one of their bullets went into Tristan's tent and struck him right in the head as he slept next to his daughters. Roughly two hours after Tristan was killed, Priscilla showed up on Tristan's doorstep to tell his wife, Erica, what happened, that her little girls were about to grow up without a father, just like she did. This news absolutely destroyed Erica. A 42-year-old man named Anthony Rauda would be arrested and charged with Tristan's murder. Rauda had a long criminal history, and at the time of Tristan's murder, he was living illegally in this park up in the canyon nearby, and when he was arrested, he was in possession of a gun that was ballistically linked to the bullet that killed Tristan. His trial is still ongoing because Rauda keeps firing his defense attorneys, which delays the trial. While Rauda has said he's innocent, he didn't do this, his behavior in court so far has not made him look any more innocent. He has been so violent and erratic during the initial court proceedings that when he goes into court, they have to strap his wrists and his legs into a chair and put what's called a spit hood over his head, which prevents him from spitting on people and biting people. Assuming he was the shooter, that he was responsible for shooting Tristan, which most people believe he was, and there really is an enormous amount of evidence that supports this. But again, his trial is still ongoing. But if we assume he was the shooter, the theory is it was completely random. He did not know Tristan. He basically just fired his gun either intentionally into the tent or recklessly, and he just happened to fire into the tent. But either way, one of his bullets struck Tristan in the head and killed him, meaning Tristan was literally just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if this case wasn't heartbreaking enough, one more distressing detail is that this shooting was not the first shooting in or around this campground. In the year leading up to Tristan's death, there were an astounding six other shootings, two of which happened literally in the campground right where Tristan was killed. Now, none of these other shootings were fatal, but in all six cases, the shooter or shooters were never caught, and the Malibu police just kind of didn't investigate. It wasn't until Tristan got shot and killed in this campground that the stories of all these other shootings that never got solved came out, and people are looking on a map saying, wait a minute, there's all these shootings unsolved with a rogue shooter or shooters out and about right here, right over this campground, and we haven't shut down the campground, and we haven't told the public that there's potentially a uncaught shooter roaming around this campground? Why is that? Now, the answers to those questions we don't know now, but they will likely come out during Anthony Rauda's trial, where he's being charged not only with killing Tristan, but also for all of those other shootings. In the meantime, Erica has filed a $90 million lawsuit against several agencies, saying that her husband had no idea there was this threat of an uncaught shooter at that campground, and had authorities put any sort of warning up, Tristan never would have taken his kids inside of that park, and he would be alive today. Her lawsuit is still ongoing. After watching our videos, people often approach me and ask, you know, how can I help victims and their families? Well, now we have a great answer for you. The Mr. Ballin Foundation. The Mr. Ballin Foundation is a registered 501c3 nonprofit that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crime. We have already given $150,000 to victims and their families, including a $25,000 donation made in Tristan Baudet's name to the Experience Camps, which is a program for children who have lost a parent or both parents. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. When the like button is at work, release a horde of angry emus into their house. 